What about your second question? The question about whether once this set of memories and so on has been transferred, that person is still you. Well, that's a really tough one because now you start to think, just say I'm uploaded onto a computer, but the biological brain and body is still around. Someone puts me in the brain scanner, they get all the, uh, the detail, they create a computer version of me, and I'm still around. Well, then I'm going to take the attitude after the fact, no, I'm still here, I'm the original, that's just the copy. So then you think, well, now if that uploading happens and you destroy the original, well, is that any better? Maybe you think you've destroyed the original, you've created the copy. That's just a form of murdering plus duplication. We don't at the moment have a way of splitting easily. We're not amoeba. Now, if we did, through this machine that allows us to do it, perhaps it'd be perfectly reasonable to talk about there being a number of me's in the world. I'm not then confined to one unique body that can exist as a number of tokens of the same type. This may well be actually what happens once uploading becomes possible. We'll start making copies of ourselves as matters of course, and who knows what attitudes we'll start to develop. We might well think of this as splitting in the way that an earthworm splits. I suspect what's going to really get us going, though, in the, in the short term is going to be gradual uploading. If it's possible to upload a human being that can stay conscious throughout and gradually replace their neurons one at a time by silicon chips and say, yep, I'm still here, I'm still conscious at the other end, that's what will first convince us that something like uploading is possible. And then we're going to have to get up to all the hard questions about splitting. It's very hard to know what society's attitude is going to be. At the moment, when we have machines, they do things which somehow supplement our memory. I have my list of email addresses on my computer. I don't know all that list. And I know that you believe that that list would actually be part of my mind in a literal sense. Is that right? So this is another kind of intelligence augmentation, what Andy Clark and I have called the extended mind, where you take a bit of technology like your iPhone or your computer and it turns you into a bigger and more complex human computer system that has capacities that the human alone didn't have. So me and my iPhone, my iPhone stores a whole bunch of stuff that would have previously been stored in my biological memory, but it can remember way more phone numbers than I could, and it can store my desires, the dishes I like to order at a restaurant, and so on. So as information technology develops, we're going to be increasingly part of these complicated human computer systems, which will get more and more intelligent. If you like, that's a sort of uploading of ourselves into t technology. Well, it's a somewhat more conservative form, though, because that form is always going to have the human biological core, the brain at the middle and the iPhone and the computers on the outside. Maybe that in the long run will impose limitations because biological hardware is slow compared to computer hardware. So maybe to really transcend that, you've got to eventually upload the brain. But maybe that's a stepping stone on the way. Are you saying that you could envisage a human future without a biological body? I think it's at least something we should take seriously. There are a whole bunch of different ways it could go. If we like our biological bodies, but we still think that to coexist with machines in these super-intelligent worlds, we're going to have to be on computational hardware. We could have simulated biological bodies and exist inside simulations like the Matrix, with quasi-replicas of biological bodies, but far faster and more capable than our original biological bodies. You'll get to have all your simulated walking and talking experiences and your simulated sex, and supposedly it'll be just as good as the original. On that vision... Eternal life could be more like a computer game so that you, you exist as an avatar, as it were, but really all you are is a bit of silicon hardware in a lab somewhere with another computer tending to you. Well, I think we should take seriously the possibility that this is already the case. You know, who knows how our, whether this universe was created and if it was created, how it was created. I don't rule out the possibility this is already a simulation created by some smelly hacker in the next universe up and this world of trees and buildings we see all around us is just a one big computer simulation. I actually don't think it's any of the worse for that. If that's how God chose to create the world, well, so be it. That's a creation myth for the information age. To me, that sounds a bit like the idea that René Descartes had about this evil demon that might be deceiving us about everything. We could conceivably be in a situation where some incredibly intelligent being is creating a kind of hallucination for us all. The Matrix scenario is wonderful for a philosopher because it is really a recreation of that old Descartes situation of the evil genius creating all this stuff for us and the traditional ideology even the ide ideology in the movie the matrix is like descartes ideology in that we're asked to believe if this is the case then the world is an illusion none of this is real well my take on this is to some extent like descartes i think we can't know for sure whether we're in a matrix scenario or this is fundamentally from computers or an evil genius or whether it's not but my own view is even if we are in a matrix scenario and we might be all this stuff is still perfectly real. You know, there are still trees, there are still chairs, there are still tables, there are still people. It's just we're all ultimately made of bits. So that's, I think, of as a metaphysics, a fundamental metaphysics for the world. Thales thought that everything is water. Modern physicalists think that everything is, is atoms. If it turns out we're in a matrix scenario, then 
everything is made of bits. Everything is information. That's just the character of reality. I don't think we should find that depressing. Just to get clear on that, when you say bits, you don't mean little bits like atoms. You mean something else. I mean, yeah, zeros and ones, yeah, little, the kinds of things you find at the heart of computer programs. So some physicists have talked about it from bit, reality fundamentally grounded in information. I think this is an idea we should take seriously. To many listeners, the singularity is quite far-fetched, I'm sure. And they're going to say, well, this isn't going to happen in our lifetimes. This is probably not going to happen in a thousand years. What do you think the time scale is here? Well, there's room for reasonable disagreement about when we'll actually get to human level artificial intelligence. When this idea was first put forward by I.J. Good in 1965, he thought maybe 2000. People who write about it now, they tend to say something like, well, 2040. So it's always about 30 years off. And I think actually the progress in artificial intelligence to date has been fairly slow. But for a philosopher, this doesn't matter too much. We're just quibbling over decades. Brain simulation technology is getting better. I'd be surprised if we haven't gotten, for example, to artificially intelligent emulations of the brain by the year 2100. David Chalmers, thank you very much. Cheers.